With the end of the Second World War and the uncertainties of a new war, many nations sought to design weapons as revolutionary and as powerful as possible. This often involved thinking outside the box, resulting in some odd and interesting designs. One of these projects was the K-91, born at a time when the Soviet Union had a hypersaturated market in regards to general tank development and especially heavy tanks. Hello, my name is Tony, and today we will look at a very unusual Soviet vehicle. If you like our videos and want to support us, please consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to improve future tank encyclopedia content. Any help will be greatly appreciated. On 18th February 1949, the Council of Ministers of the USSR cancelled all development of heavy tanks weighing 50 tons and above, putting an end to tanks such as the IS-7. Instead, work was shifted to designing lighter heavy tanks. Thus, SKP-2 and Factory No. 100 of Chelyabinsk were assigned work in designing a new heavy tank, which would eventually become the T-10. With the cancellation of most heavy tank programs, the Design Bureau of the Engineering Committee of the Armed Forces, OKBICSV, led by Anatoly Fedorovich Kravtsev, saw the opportunity to design a unique set of vehicles. By this point, Kravtsev's Design Bureau had experience in designing light tanks and APCs, but never had them mass-produced, such as the K-75. Kravtsev's team envisioned something special. This was not to be any regular heavy tank, rather, they would look back at wartime vehicles which tried to combine and replace both medium and heavy tanks, while still being a solid platform for self-propelled guns, a concept that became mainstream later on. In charge of their program was lead engineer I.T. Levinov, while the designer was Matyukhin. They designed three vehicles, two heavy tanks, one with a front-mounted turret, one with a rear-mounted turret, and a tank destroyer or self-propelled gun. In this article, the first variant will be discussed. The first variant, besides being the most sensible, was also the one that was considered the most, with a total of five drawings. It featured a massive turret that housed all four crewmen, including the driver. The hull was extremely low, thanks to the movement of the driver through the turret and usage of a boxer engine. This was done not only to decrease the area and silhouette of the vehicle, but also to make it lighter and harder to hit. The bizarre aura of the vehicle continues, with a very strange set of road wheels, with torsion bar suspension and a large frontal sprocket. To create more room inside the tank, the sides of the hull follow the shape of the track, which required the addition of round skids to prevent the track from hitting the hull violently. The armament would be a modest 100mm gun with a coaxial DHSK, and one more on the roof for AA protection. In terms of protection, however, the tank stood out with around 200mm of raw thickness on the upper frontal plate and turret. The crew consisted of four men, a commander, a gunner, a driver, and a loader. They were all seated in the turret. The gunner sat on the left side of the gun, in the front of the turret. He had no periscopes, but had to rely on his gun sight for vision. Considering the shape of the turret, which featured two unevenly sized bulges protruding from the otherwise rounded turret, the gunner had to share the entry and escape hatch with the commander. The commander sat right behind the gunner and had only one periscope for vision. This meant that he had a hard time surveilling the battlefield and searching for targets for the gunner. On the front right side of the gun sat the driver, who had a pivoting driving system. This allowed the turret to turn freely while the driver would still be in the same position. It is unclear if the turret would have been able to complete a full 360 degree turn with this system. The driver did have two periscopes for vision. What could be the loaders? It is hard to tell from the drawings. The loader sat behind the driver, slightly more towards the center, with full access to the gun breech. He had the not-so-easy task of maneuvering the large 100mm rounds through the very low roof of the turret. The ammunition was placed all around the rear of the turret and inside the turret ring. As proof that even the designers found the turret roof to be too low, they had to make a cutout and slight bulge in the armor so that the head of the loader would actually fit. To put it into perspective, the average tanker was between 160 to 170 centimeters in height. The main gun was to be a 100mm D46T. This was a brand new gun developed by OKB No. 9 as a replacement to the D10T. 
The project was greenlit on 21st of May 1948, and two were produced in factory number 9 in 1949. It was, however, most likely cancelled and used for the development of the D-54. The shells weighed between 16 and 17 kilograms and would have had a muzzle velocity of 1,000 meters per second. The gun had plus 20 degree of elevation and minus 3 degree of depression. The secondary armament consisted of two 12.7mm DHSK heavy machine guns. One was mounted coaxially on the right side of the gun. This does raise questions of who could have loaded it and cleared jams. The driver was the only one that could realistically reach it, but that involved the driver not driving the tank. The loader would have been required to almost lay over the gun to reach the machine gun. To decrease the height of the hull as much as possible, a boxer engine was used. Boxer engines have the cylinders arranged horizontally, facing away from each other. This allows for much lower engines, but considerably wider compared to straight heads or V-shaped ones. The engine was most likely a V64 12-cylinder diesel, outputting around 700 to 800 horsepower. On this variant, the engine was placed in the rear behind the turret, while the gearbox and transmission were in the front, where the drive wheels were also located. To transmit the power, a large shaft ran through the entire length of the vehicle in between the torsion bars and turret ring floor. The suspension of the K91 was very unusual. It had 9 road wheels per side, attached with suspension arms to torsion bars. The first three arms were facing the opposite from the last four. The first and last two wheels were sprung by just one torsion bar and attached via a pivoting bogey. The idler was the same as the road wheels, while the sprocket was very large to allow for good crossing of obstacles. The suspension seems to have had very little space in which the wheel could move, meaning either that it had to be quite hard or the wheels would easily hit the bump stops and transfer the rest of the shop to the hull. As expected, the K91 was very well protected, with around 200mm of armor on the upper frontal plate angled at 45 degree. The lower frontal plate was around 150mm angled at 50 degree. The frontal cheeks were vertical, but angled outward from a frontal viewpoint. They were 150mm thick, and so was the side armor, which was completely flat. Rear armor seems to have been two angled 75 or 100mm plates. The turret was extremely complex in its design. It appears to have been cast with several uneven bulges for the crew. It was 200mm thick at the base and got exponentially thinner as the angling got higher. The bulges remained 200mm thick as they were less angled. It is hard to tell if the vehicle remained under the 50 ton threshold, but considering its small profile and smaller gun compared to most Soviet heavy tanks, it could have reached 45 plus tons. Kraftsev's bureau designed two more vehicles as the K91, a self-propelled gun version based on this variant and a heavy auto-looting tank with a rear-mounted turret. None of the three K91 vehicles designed at OKP ICSV got far due to the apparent lack of improvement over contemporary heavy and medium tanks. The vehicles were quite complex and expensive from a design viewpoint, but were fundamentally crude and rudimentary. The designs were terminated in late 1949. Kraftsev's bureau went back to designing APCs and light tanks, and developed the K-78, K-90, and K-61, among others. And that's it for this video. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscription. You can find more information relating to this vehicle in the full article which is linked in the description. If you like what we are doing and want to let us continue working on these videos, please consider donating on Patreon or Paypal. All of the funds will be allocated to improving our articles and videos for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.